Too many chords up here. But we want to welcome all of you this, tonight. Christ is born, and we're excited to wish you a Merry Christmas tonight. And as we come together tonight, we are thankful that we can worship uh, together here and also online tonight. Uh, those of you who are with us online, we're thankful that you can be with us as well. And, and tonight, we have a number of songs that we'll sing together some scripture readings about uh, Christ being born, and also just some dramas that will be about some people that encountered Jesus and how Jesus transformed their life. And so tonight, as uh, I welcome you, I'm thankful that uh, you could be here uh, with us. And uh, I'm just going to open it with a word of prayer, all right? Father, thank you so much for allowing us to gather together here at Woodstock Christian School and then also online as well. I just pray, Father, that you would bless our time together as uh, we sing songs of praise, as we hear the scriptures, the story of Jesus, and then the stories of people who have been transformed by Jesus. All down through the centuries, we're thankful that the gospel of Jesus Christ transforms lives that we can have our lives forgiven, that we can have the resurrection of life of Jesus in our life, and that we have one who brings us the joy and peace and love and faith that we need in these days that are upon us. So bless us, we pray. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.
you ever been sick? That's a silly question. Of course you have. You're a person in a body in this world with its troubles and viruses and disease. Most of us, thank God, live in a pretty good health. We go about so many of our days not even thinking about our bodies, but the moment we fall ill, perhaps with a cold, or maybe you throw out your back, or break a bone, it's all you can think about. Pain, discomfort, your limitations. You're suddenly aware of the gift of good health when it's gone. You kick yourself for not being more grateful when you're well. You realize you lived a miracle of happiness and wellness every day until the sickness started. But have you ever been sick for like an entire year? For five years? How about a decade living with an ailment? It almost destroyed me. Financially, I bled my family dry. And to add insult to injury, the care I received wasn't even very good. We spent all we had on doctors. How can you get good medical attention when the doctors themselves are afraid to touch you? And then the mind starts to play games. What if this is the new normal? What if this sickness never goes away? Did I do something wrong? Did I do something to deserve this? And then the most terrifying question of them all, is God punishing me because he is displeased with me? It was that question, that terrible question of them all that I lived with the better part of a decade, long decade. And believe me, I wasn't just beating myself up. The law told me I was unclean. Moses wrote about my condition like this. When a woman's discharge of blood flows many days, all of the days of her discharge, is, she is unclean. Any bed she lies in, any furniture she sits on, it's all unclean. Imagine not being able to hold your spouse's hand, to greet a friend on the street, to sit down and share a meal. Imagine not being able to touch the face of the child you love. And if your child does touch you, if in a moment of joy or pain, your spouse reaches out to touch your hand, if in a moment of forgetfulness, a friend greets you and sits down on the same bench you're sitting on, then they too become unclean and must wash everything and isolate until evening. I couldn't buy food in the markets, prepare a meal for the family. Everything I did and anyone or anything I touched was tainted. My life, my very presence was a burden to everyone I knew at first. Then it was a terrible, shameful reminder of sin. For 12 very, 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 very long years, then came Jesus into the world, into my world, on my street. Oh, I'd, I'd heard of him, of his trouble, of his humble birth, of the miracles he performed, the blind could see, the lame could walk, the deaf could hear, and demons raged out of bodies and into the abyss at his command. I heard that he taught with authority, loved little children, was born of a virgin in a manger of all places. He shamed the wisdom and pride of the Pharisees with simple, powerful words. He was the Messiah, sent by God, just as the prophets promised to set us free from the oppression of our enemies. I heard the stories about Jesus and sat in awe, alone in my dark room, hidden from the world in my wretchedness. And then he walked down my street. 
Christmas for many has become this beautiful but strange celebration that so often overlooks the simple and shocking human story of Jesus' birth, his advent into the world. There we were, humanity alone, lost, without hope, desperate, forgotten, powerless to help ourselves, but so in need of help, unclean and unable to make ourselves clean so in need of God's touch. And suddenly, there he was, among us, God's answer to all our pain, the great healer, our redeemer, on my street. And so I ran to him, and I reached out my hand. My friends, oh my friends, in a single moment, as I reached in faith to touch the hem of his garment, Jesus healed me. I was so afraid to be in that crowd that my touch might make everyone in the crowd unclean, make Jesus himself unclean. Then I was in the midst of the crowd within reach, breaking the law to be set free from uh, its its impossible demands. My uncleanliness was erased right there for all to see. On my first Christmas, when Jesus walked onto my street and entered my circumstances, he transformed my darkness and pain in a moment. He brought all my hope to life. Sisters and brothers, Jesus came into the world to help you in your pain and helplessness. This Christmas, may you see he is present in your life and body to bring you living hope. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2 and 6 to 7. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Let's stand together and sing about this light of the world.
Amen. Please be seated. People ask, what was it like to be in that frame of mind? To be honest with you, you don't want to know. I'll say this, go to your darkest moment, your worst hour. Think of a moment in your life that represents some great despair, the valley of the shadow of death. That was my best day. Now add the screaming voice of your accuser, shouting every lie you've ever heard or believed about yourself, shouting every fear, each and every waking moment. It was like a wind howling, a wind unleashed inside my body, the kind of wind that overturns fishing boats, like the ones on the Sea of Galilee. In the middle of the night, cold and so loud, you have to shout to hear your own voice. So loud, you beg for it to stop but no one else hears it. You're willing to do anything to make it stop so you can just think, so your mind, so your body can finally, for once, just rest. For a lot of people, the Christmas story begins at the manger, and their first glimpse of Jesus is as a sweet little baby. First time I encountered Jesus, he terrified me. He wasn't a sweet little babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in straw. He was a grown man with eyes that blazed like fire, wrapped in the power of God. I actually screamed out his name. It was my voice, but it wasn't me speaking. It's not something a lot of people like to talk about, especially today. But the first encounter I had with Jesus, he cast an evil spirit out of me. Not just one, many. It had been years, years, not having a sound mind, I couldn't even remember my own name, couldn't think my own coherent thoughts. It was like I was trapped in my own body, buried in there somewhere, and not myself. And then those winds would rage, like a storm that could knock over trees, houses. I was like a hurricane of anger in my community. It causes me great shame to say it, but I was so dangerous my family had to put me in chains. Think of that. Can you imagine your own, putting your own boy, that sweet little child that you raised, into shackles because he was such a danger to you? How many years did my own mother pray for me, have to avoid me just to be safe from me, fear me? It's unbelievable to say it now, but the only place I could find solace to sleep was in the graveyard. I found rest in tombs, lived for the night. My only human companions were no longer alive. But then Jesus arrived on our shores. At Genesaree, he came after a night when there was a terrible storm that raged across the Sea of Galilee. He calmed that storm. And then he commanded legion out of me. Jesus was completely unafraid of me. He saw me, and he had mercy on me. For the first time in my life, I experienced the quiet that comes after a storm, and that quiet remained. For the first time in my life, I felt whole, and I felt safe. It was shalom. It was actual peace. Body, soul, mind, my spirit. Finally, my own spirit, too. That was my first Christmas right there on those shores. That was the advent of Jesus in my life. He came to my troubled world and saved me in the midst of it. He calmed the storm. I was naked, literally naked, and Jesus wrapped me in clothes like you would an infant newly born. I was hungry, starving for purpose and peace, and Jesus fed me with the bread of life. I was shrouded in fear and darkness, and Jesus shone the light of truth and cast out all fear. Oh, friends, if you imagined how great my darkness, can you not now imagine how bright and sweet that new light, how purifying, how holy, how so very real? In an instant, everything changed. How I longed to stay in that moment with him right at his feet forever. If you read the story of it in Luke's account, you'll see that I begged. I really did beg Jesus to stay with him. But on my first Christmas, 
Jesus sent me home. He told me to go and share my story, to tell the good news, to share with people all the good things that Jesus had done for me. I love to tell my story at Christmas because it's at Christmas that we stop and remember the advent of the Savior of the world who came to bring us peace. The world needs the transformative peace of God. My story is extreme, but like me, you may need the peace of Christ to rule in your body today, to comfort and to calm your inner world, that storm inside of you that rages. Like me, you need the peace of Christ to quiet your mind, restore your soul, and transform your circumstances. Jesus came into our world to calm the raging storm and to give you peace. Oh, sisters, brothers, may the peace of God clothe and cover you today. Luke chapter 1, verse 26 to 38. Birth of Jesus foretold. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a, man's name, who, to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of Most High. And the Lord God will give, great, give to him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month with her, who is called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. They're shining brightly as the choir of angels sing, singing praise. Now in the highest at the birth of Christ the King, you saw the lights. They're shining brightly as the choir of angels sing. Singing praise now in the highest at the birth of Christ the King. Open my eyes, O oh heart, believe the wonder of the Christmas night.
Christmas lights will shine for you and you alone. All the lights are shining brightly at the glory of your King. All the lights are shining brightly at the glory. Shining brightly at the glory of the King. All the lights are shining brightly at the glory of your name. All the lights are shining When you look at me, you probably don't see a man who is run down or trampled by horses. And if you do, you need to see your eye doctor. <laughs> you probably can't tell either that I was someone who worried a lot. By the way, that horse thing and anxiety are connected. Maybe you've heard of that psalm that goes, do not fret, it only leads to evil. Well, let me tell you. It's true. My life until I met Jesus was one long, tiring fret. I was like Samson, chained to that millstone, turning that big round object to grind grain. My chains were resentment and anger. But unlike Samson, I wasn't strong. In fact, I was weaker than the weak Samson after he was duped by Delilah and they cut his hair. That's right. These legs and these arms were useless. I was bedridden and paralyzed, unable to move my body. The only thing I could move was my mind, and it pushed thoughts around and around, worried and angry. I guess you could say I was paralyzed in body and mind, because that kind of thinking led nowhere. I was so stuck, but hey, Who's going to criticize a paralytic, am I right? When I shared my despair with friends and family, well, no one could blame me. All that potential, all that possibility, lying there with dormant, useless limbs. What were they to do? Add insult to injury and tell me to cheer up? Well, I wasn't anything special before the accident. I mean, on weekends, I attended the synagogue. During the week, I worked. I did my best to follow the law, and I made the necessary sacrifices to atone for the big stuff. You know, a few turtle doves here and there, the occasional goat. 
I wasn't overly religious, but I had a real zest for life. Well, all that zest was quickly zapped when I stepped in the path of a unit of Roman soldier horses as they were screeching through a uh, side street to quell a, a quarrel by the temple. We were in the holy city during the festival. And what can I say? I was full of uh, fervor and uh, passion and that energy you get when you're with people you love on the streets of the holy city. I felt invincible. <laughs> you would think I was a high priest the way the people uh, revered me. I mean, they would say, um, a Hebrew of Hebrews who stood up the Rome, they would say. <laughs> the last stand I ever took. And so my bitterness and my anger were never really checked or challenged by those around me until I met Jesus, that is. At Christmas, we tend to use the words like hope and peace and joy, as we very well should. But we often overlook the reason why those words have such an appeal to us in the first place. Until the advent of Jesus in my life, I lived on the opposite side of those words. In despair and the regret that tells you every day that there is no reason to hope and no way to experience joy again. It was my, my friends who made a hole in the roof and uh, lowered me down, plopped me right in front of Jesus. <laughs> you should have seen the look on his face. And the strangest thing that day was what Jesus said for everyone to hear. Friend, your sins are forgiven. And, and may I say, dare I say that the profound respect Jesus had for my friends for the move they made by placing me in front of them. Some say my friends were motivated by guilt. But Jesus himself recognized that they were moved by faith in him to heal me. I don't know what I expected precisely. I wanted him to reach out and touch me and heal me. I imagined it a thousand times when I heard about his miraculous power. But Jesus said what no one else would say. I was a sinner with a sickness that went much deeper than my body. A man with a problem worse than failed limbs. Well, <laughs> you know the rest of the story. Look at me. Uh, I, uh, I stood up picked up my bed, walked out, the whole future ahead of me, restored and set free. Oh, the religious people were scandalized. Those who were hungry for righteousness had their needs met. And those with eyes to see saw the glory of God revealed. It's kind of a perfect Christmas story, isn't it? <laughs> Suddenly there's Jesus in the midst of humanity. After all those dark days, just as surprising as a grown man as he was a baby, Emmanuel, God with us. And the force of the collision, as the truth of who Jesus is impacts the human heart, is more violent and transformative than the impact of a charging Roman horse against the body. With a single word, Hear me, with a single word, Jesus can set you free from your sin and despair into what can only be described as true joy. <laughs> I am no elegant or sophisticated man that deserves God's grace, but I was given his grace anyway. God's grace changed me forever. I hope you encounter Jesus' grace in a way that changes you this Advent season. Luke 8 to 20. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, 
Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds had said to them. But Mary treasured up these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. Let's continue to worship together and stand and sing, O Little Town of Bethlehem. Thank you. Please be seated. Have you ever had someone look at you with disgust? It's hard to explain because it can be so subtle, but you know it painfully. You terribly know it when it happens. They take in a breath slowly, and as they do, their body expands, their shoulders widen, their neck elongates, their nostrils flare, and for a moment, you are the center of the world of thought, not ignored, not invisible, but the focus, and this is what's so hard to explain, but you just know it when it happens. There's that that look, you know, the the slight nodding of the head or, or the jaw set slightly to one side, the eyelids squint, or maybe the, the upper lip moves slightly as they bite the tip of their tongue. And there, in a blink, 
and a flicker of contempt, and your worth is assessed. Not a word is spoken between you, but they've communicated as clearly as if they've shouted it. You're disgusting. Dismissed. Disposable. That's a good word for it. I've always been disposable to men, especially the religious leaders. Of course, there are words for those looks too, but they're not worth repeating here. I'm sure you can imagine what they would call someone like me. You know, a woman with no prospects. A woman without a husband. And a sinner at that. I lived being looked at with disgust. But do you know what I feared the most? More than whether there'd be anything to eat from day to day, or how I'd pay off my debts, or what I would have to do to earn the money to pay the debts back. More than anything, I feared to look at Jesus because of the way the Pharisees looked at me. Oh, I could, I could bear the look from those self-proclaimed religious men, although their scorn caused me great pain. I learned to live with their disgust. Most of us had to, because there's nothing that we could do to please them anyway. You don't have to be a scribe to understand that some of them, through their own shame, on me because it was their acts towards me that made me a sinner in the first place. I watched him, you know, from a distance as he walked the outskirts of the town, <laughs> greeting the children, touching the sick, laughing with those that he had just set free from demons, from cancer, from, rep from leprosy. He healed people of everything. It was incredible. And you don't have to be a religious person to see that Jesus was sent from God into the world. But I kept my distance because, well, I couldn't bear the thought of having the Messiah look at me the same way that the Pharisees looked at me. If he was disgusted, I would know. And if his famous love for the poor didn't fall on me, I would see that. So I stayed away from him until I could no longer stay away. I just had to know. I will never forget it. When Jesus first looked at me, I walked through the, through the crowd, timid as a mouse, and trying to hide myself in the throng of people, but then the, the crowd moved when he stood up and he turned and, and almost by chance, our eyes met. And I don't care what anyone else says. It was, it was like that story from Joshua. When the sun stood still and time stopped, when he just looked at me, our eyes locked. And the same man who told the famous parable about the shepherd who went looking for the one lost sheep, he was looking back at me. There was no disgust. There was no disdain. I was seen. I was really seen. And my friends, he didn't look away. His eyes were full of love. He smiled with happiness to see me, like I was a long-lost friend. 
And somehow, somehow he knew exactly who I was and everything I had done. The bad, the sin, and the good too, but he still didn't look away. He reached out his hand. He smiled, and he called me daughter. Not woman lost in sin. None of the other names everyone always called me. But daughter. And I think, I think you've heard the rest of the story. I can't believe how many people know it. You know about the alabaster jar of perfume and how I entered into the house where Jesus was visiting for a feast and I washed his feet with my tears as I wept. And that was my first Christmas. Right here, in a forgotten town. He wasn't a sweet babe, wrapped in swathing clothes, lying in straw. The Jesus I met was a man. He was surrounded by people who wanted his attention and help. And Jesus met me in my forgottenness and shame. And he looked at me with love. And that was at the house of Simon, the Pharisee, where I couldn't restrain the love of God that changed my life in an instant. It was a pure love, a forgiving love, and it was a love that set me free. So today, as you ponder the Advent, sisters and brothers, remember that Jesus, Jesus sees you when he looks at you with love. Hi, Pastor Robin. What are we talking about tonight? Well, Rudy, tonight we're going to review the candles of the Advent. So, can you help me? Sure. I should remember them. A year has gone by since I thought it was a crown that lit up, and I've learned a lot since then. Well, you know what? I'm glad you've learned a lot, too, about Christmas and what it's all about. So, let's just start from the top. What was the first candle we lit? Tonight? Oh, pick me, pick me, pick me, please. And here's Rudy with the answer. Hope, because God's people hoped that the Messiah would come, and he came. And uh, so, Rudy... Hope is the first one. So what's the second one? Oh, pick me, please, pick me, please, please, pick me. Uh, Rudy, this is a one-on-one -on -one thing right now. I'm going to pick you every time. Well, that would have been nice to know. You know how competitive I get, Pastor Robin. <laughs> well, do you remember hmm. the second one? Hmm. You know what, Rudy? I have faith in you that you'll remember this one. Thanks, Pastor Robin. That means a lot. Hmm, hmm. Wait a second. I'm having a flashback to you crushing me last year with the trust fall. Is it faith? Correct. It's faith. And we learned an important lesson, didn't we, Pastor Robin? Yeah, we remember, we remember that faith, when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, uh, he gives us peace in our life. And faith is a gift that God gives us so that we can trust in Jesus and have this peace in our life that we all need. Absolutely. And? Well, the other thing I learned about you is that you need to put on a little bit more muscle to hold me instead of drop me in a trust fall. Hey, this is lean muscle. Well, you might think so, but uh, let's keep going. What's the next candle? Oh, I know this one. I got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Where? Down in my heart. Where? Down in my heart. Down in my heart today. Well, can anybody tell me <laughs> what, what, what this next candle is through Rudy's song? What is it? 
joy. That's right, Rudy. Your song just let it all out tonight. Yes, we can rejoice always because he has blessed us with so much, including the amazing gift of sending his one and only son to die on the cross to save us. Salvation is definitely something to have joy about. It sure is, Rudy. So what's the last candle? Does anybody in the audience know? The very last one. Hmm. Hmm. Love, because God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. We can see the love of God through his son, Jesus, and we can have peace knowing all things are in his good hands. Jesus is so amazing, isn't he? He sure is, Rudy. Thanks so much for helping me tonight. In, in, in the next few minutes, we're going to light the last candle for Christmas Eve right after a great song called Emmanuel, God with us. So why don't you sit down with everybody else and enjoy this song and just think about the words, Emmanuel, God with us. Sure thing, Pastor Robin. Merry Christmas, everyone.
What a blessing to light the Christ candle tonight on this Christmas Eve, knowing that Emmanuel came for us, God with us. The amazing thing about Jesus Christ is that he was the God who created the whole universe. Scientists tell us that there's a planet or a star for every grain of sand that's on the earth. That's how vast the universe is. And yet, this God who created this universe, who is outside of this universe, came to meet our need. In fact, John says that he was with God in the beginning. And then it goes on in John chapter one to say that he is the true light the true light, and light is truth. And in this world where so many people want to protect their truth, there's only truth. Truth is still truth, no matter what opinion you have. But Jesus Christ has come. He has come to set us free from sin so that we can experience new life in him. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life and no one comes unto the Father except through me. The amazing gift of Christmas is Jesus Christ. And the Bible says very clearly, if we confess with our mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. Just like the stories of those four people that encountered Jesus during his ministry that we, that we heard from tonight, that story can be ours as well because Jesus is still transforming lives all over the earth. Did you know that there are 2.2 billion Christians on the earth today? And every continent has people who name the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and they're trusting him. And so throughout the earth on this weekend, people are celebrating the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ who can transform your life and my life because of what he's done for us. The amazing gift of Jesus came to us that first Christmas. He grew, lived a perfect life, and went and died on the cross shedding his blood for all of our sin and then was buried, and then rose again so that we could experience resurrection life with him if we trust him. And tonight, our hope is that you would trust Jesus as your Lord and Savior. That like so many of us here tonight, and so many of us who are watching at home, have experienced the grace and love of Jesus Christ who transforms us from the inside out. Our world says you can transition outside of yourself. But Jesus does something completely different. He transforms us from the inside out so that we can be part of the family of God and to be his child. And so tonight, we celebrate the Lord Jesus Christ. And we hope that he is your hope, your peace, your joy, and the love of your life as God wants it to be, so that in this world that is full of confusion, that's full of fear, you can have faith to conquer anything forever because you're part of his eternal family. Let me pray for us tonight. Father, as we pray and as we celebrate with this great Christmas song at the end, Silent Night, I thank you that, Heavenly Father, you sent Jesus to be our Savior and the Lord of our life. Lord, you call us once we trust you to allow you to be the Lord, the boss, the leader of our life, and that you will fill us with your Holy Spirit so that we can walk with you a transformed, spirit-filled life that glorifies you, just like those shepherds did so long ago. Father, I thank you that for centuries now, you have been transforming people's lives. And I thank you, Lord, that in the times that we live in, you are still doing that in very powerful ways. Thank you for loving us so much. The creator God who sent his one and only son to be our savior so that we do not perish, but we have 
everlasting life. We praise you and we thank you this evening, Lord. Thank you for Christmas. Thank you for Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. We just want to conclude tonight by singing the beautiful carol, Silent Night. We want you to take your glow sticks, and if you crack them, they should start glowing. And, the, and we're going to actually, I think we're going to turn the lights out, and then we're going to sing Silent Night. So please stand and join us. Father, we are so thankful this evening that you sent Jesus Christ. Christ the Savior is born. We just pray your blessing upon every person here this evening and those who are watching online with us. And we thank you, Father, that Jesus came to save us and to change us and to give us eternal life. And we are thankful for this hope and this joy and this faith and peace that you give to us because of your great love. And I just pray your blessing upon all of us. We pray for us, those who know you, that we would bring the true light of Christ to our friends and family over this Christmas season and this holiday season. And that you would help us, Lord, just to live lives that just know you and have been changed by you. And for those, Father, without hope, maybe have heaviness of heart, heaviness upon themselves. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that your gift of salvation is available to anyone to trust you, to believe in you, and then walk with you in a relationship that is so transforming. I just pray your blessing as we go this evening, and we just thank you, Father, for your presence with us. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to thank you all for being with us both here 
at Woodstock Christian School with Oxford Baptist Church and those of you who are online with us as well. Uh, may you have a very Merry Christmas and on behalf of my wife and I, Gwen, and our family and our elders and leadership team here at Oxford, may you just experience God's grace as we enter into this new year as well together. God bless you all. Thanks for being with us.